When you think of Sweden, what comes to mind? IKEA? ABBA? Maybe those delicious cinnamon rolls? But what about these? Swedish meatballs, right? Well, maybe not. Welcome to the Meatball Mystery. Let's cut straight to the chase. It's hard to make the Swedes angry, but on one fateful day, something happened that fired up the whole country. This tweet was sent from the official Sweden Twitter account. Swedish meatballs actually based on a recipe from King Charles XII brought back from Turkey in the early 18th century. Let's stick to the facts. Yikes. Did you catch that? The tweet said that Swedish meatballs actually come from Turkey. As you can imagine, the tweet went viral. Swedes were up in arms. It was picked up all around the world. The Swedish government has admitted Swedish meatballs are actually Turkish. What? What? No, that's not a fact. The facts is really interesting since we don't have any facts from that period. Wait, who are you? My name is Richard Telström and I'm a food historian. Okay, here's what we know. In the 1700s, Swedish King Charles XII lost a battle in the Great Northern War. He was forced to flee to the Ottoman Empire, where for several years he negotiated his return. The controversial tweet suggested that he brought back a local Turkish meat dish called koftas. However, there is no documented interest from him in food, no mentioning of the meatballs there. They are not Turkish because we can't follow the origin of meatballs in the world. There is no zero meatball where everything started. The most likely origin of the meatball is a development in parallel ways, in parallel food cultures. Therefore, meatballs are very different all over the world, but they exist all over the world. Today, it's one of Sweden's most popular dishes, traditionally served with mashed potatoes, a brown gravy, and a sweet lingonberry sauce. Mm -mm. Food gives us an example of how we are connected when it comes to culture. Food is a sort of cultural network. So take pride in your meatballs, Sweden. And so should Turkey, China, Italy, and every meatball rolling country. Because if there's one thing the world can agree on, is that meatballs are delicious. Bertrask, Northern Sweden, a small village where you can get lit by magical lights at night and during the day, you can worry about their great mystery. Yeah, somewhere between that house and these cute reindeer and this giant row of trees, there is a century-old enigma involving cheese. Yep, this big ball of cheese. Well, as for all mystery tales, a star storyteller is essential. And today, that is Tumus Rudin. Yeah, now we are. Westerbottensost is the emperor of Swedish cheeses. I've been making the Westerbottensost nearly 40 years now. It was invented a long time ago, back in 1872. The maturation is at least 14 months, because a good cheese will take its time. It's a very unique taste. It has a bitter and milky flavour, and oh, do the Swedes love it. They put it on basically everything. But for some reason, it can't be made anywhere else in the world, aside from this one factory. It's one of Sweden's greatest mysteries. We have tried to make it in Falkenberg, down in south of Sweden. Also tried to make it in Bollnäs, and also in Umeå. But it hasn't been the real Västerbotten cheese. We don't get the unique taste and flavour of it. And why? No one really knows. Some blame it on a meteor that struck the village some 20,000 years ago, which created this lake and in turn enriched the soil with calcium, which affects the cows in the region, which affects the milk and cheese they produce. Ah. Another theory suggests the cheese's unique flavour is influenced by the bacteria in the air of the old factory building. Ooh. I mean, the air is so precious to the cheese's flavour that when the building expanded, holes were made so the air from the old building would flow into the new one. There's a combination with the kind of milk that we are using from the cows in our region combined with the microflora in our dairy. 
If we call that magic or not, okay. One thing is certain, this magic cheese is kept alive by the people working on it. I feel very humble for the fact that I, I, I'm allowed to work with this cheese. It's a bit of the, the mystery, that's why it's special. Last thing, can you give us the recipe? Uh, <laughs> no, because that's the big secret with this cheese. Mmm, mystery solved, maybe. Good night. Good night. Three words you should never ask. What's in haggis? Lamb's liver, lamb hearts, lamb langs. Well, oh, too late yeah. now. Let's do the story. Onion, salt, pepper. This is Fraser McGregor. He's a haggis maker. I'm a champion haggis maker. Ah, he's a champion haggis maker here in Dingwall, Scotland at Cockburn, George and Son. And they don't hide their title. We're the first champion haggis makers in Scotland. We won the title in 1976. Chances are you've never heard of haggis, or at least you've never tried haggis. And that's because it's a very, very Scottish dish. Haggis has been around for centuries in Scotland. Um, it was evolved hundreds and hundreds of years ago to use up all the pieces of an animal, mainly lamb, as in the langs, the liver, the heart, that you wouldn't normally use in everyday cooking. Traditionally, haggis is encased in the sheep's stomach. A uh, fun fact, these days, stomachs are not really used anymore. They're actually being made in non-edible casings, which are easier to cook with, and they don't have a, uh, let's just say, distinctive odor. Making haggis is no easy feat. To make haggis from the start, from the raw ingredients, it takes roughly 18 to 20 hours. First, we cook the haggis ingredients overnight. Then we sort the meats out, we mince it all together with the dry ingredients and then after that it goes into the filling machine. It is then put into the boilers for the last and final cooking. And it's served any number of ways. Traditionally, like this, with potatoes and turnips. But today, chefs, they're getting more creative. The flavour of haggis is quite unique. It tastes savoury, very rich. You can't eat too much of it, it's quite heavy as well. Honestly, we tried the haggis and it's really good here. Anyway, this secret recipe, Fraser didn't actually make himself. The original uh, recipe was uh, introduced into the shop by Jockey McCallum. I worked with Jockey for many, many years. Uh, I've now dabbled his uh, number of years in the shop, so I think I can call it my recipe now. To keep this uh, tradition going is uh, it's quite hard in this day and age with the, the cost of everything, but uh, we've tried our best and obviously we're going to have to keep it going and pass it on to the next generation. Can we see the recipe? <laughs> no. <laughs> you can buy the shop and then I can show you. the seashore, the waves, the water, the seaweed, the sh sheep. Are they eating seaweed? We got to figure this out. So here's a little context to start off the story. We're in an island, high, high, high up in Scotland, called North Ronaldsey. It's so remote, you can only get here by ferry or airplane. And on this small, picturesque island, home to only 50 people, lives a very, very rare breed of sheep, the seaweed sheep. Meet Kevin, the authority on all things seaweed sheep. I am Kevin Woodbridge. I'm the clerk to the North Ronsley Sheep Court, which is a fairly anciently established management committee for all things sheep on the island. So let's learn more about this rare species. Welcome to Seaweed Sheep 101. The sheep must have come into to Orkney probably a thousand, two thousand years ago. There was an Orkney native breed originally, but these have branched off into their own unique uh, niche, which is just to live on seaweed. They are smaller than the average sheep, and their wool can be black, white, grey or brown. The males have big curly horns, 
and so do some females. And... They're only on North Ronds, it's the only place you can find them in the world. In about the early 19th century, they were slowly excluded to the foreshore to preserve the more fertile land inland for cattle. As a result, the sheep were confined to the seashore and were forced to survive on seaweed. This changed their digestive system over time, making them one of only two animals in the world who were able to survive on seaweed alone. And this wall, known as the sheep dike, makes sure they stay on the shore. Right, Kevin? Yes, yes, but um, I think perhaps my daughter Heather is the best person to speak to about that. Oh, OK. Well, Heather, over to you. Behind me is the native sheep dike. Um, this was constructed in 1832. The North Ronsley sheep dike is essential in the genetic structure of the sheep. North Ronsley sheep have a very high intolerance to copper, so they die from overnutrition by grazing on the grass for too long. So we keep them on the shore and they eat seaweed, which has got very low levels of iodine and copper. The community has been very concentrated on, on preserving and, and developing the sheep. Uh, the punding is obviously a big community activity. It takes everyone in the island to turn out and chase them along the beach and, and clip them up and so on. I think in many ways they define the island. It's very much embedded in the, in the island culture and that's the heritage of the island that we need to preserve. <laughs>